Hi folks and welcome to this video which is specifically for the higher media pupils who were not able to make the Teams live call on Wednesday the 17th of June. However, if you are studying cultural hegemony at any point then maybe you'll find some of this useful. So just as a quick reminder, this video I'm just going to go over the home learning task for the last fortnight which was related to cultural hegemony, where I ask you to read an article, answer some questions, and respond to some images that were part of the article, and also give your own hegemonic analysis of a film or TV programme. This was obviously your first attempt at doing something like this, so responses will vary. In terms of that final task, where I ask you to respond to a film or TV show of your choice, if you submitted that to me, I'm obviously going to give you individual feedback. I'm not going to go over that in this video because everyone has picked a different film or TV programme, so it doesn't make sense to. But the first five questions, I will certainly go over now so that you can compare them to your answers. So, first of all, the first question was, according to the article, what is hegemony? And hegemony is the concept that states that the media, film, television, advertising, news media, etc., continually reproduces images of a dominant group as superior or powerful. In the opinion of the writer, in Western society the dominant group is middle class white males because media is predominantly controlled by middle class white males. And just to kind of illustrate her point for you, um, you can see here appearing on the screens the CEOs, the head honchos of various big media conglomerates including Disney, Viacom, CBS, Amazon and you may notice that they all have one thing in common uh, they are definitely all old white dudes and the belief of the writer of the article and also a lot of people who uh, support hegemonic theory in terms of uh, cultural hegemony and when analysing the media is that this, uh, this power structure at the top trickles down. Uh, I think it's important to also think about what she's not saying in her article. She's not saying that you only see middle-class white men in media, but it's about how those middle-class white men are represented in relation to other groups. So it's not complaining about film and TV having white male characters. It's about questioning the effect of, for example, the only black character being a criminal, for example. What does that tell people of mainstream film and television features predominantly white characters and there's one black character who is a criminal what kind of message is that reinforcing okay that's obviously a hypothetical um, situation i'm talking about there but i'm sure you can think of examples yourself uh 1b uh, the question was what are the consequences for western society of um these hegemonic power structures so the writer believes that other groups in society are either represented less in the media or when they are represented, they're always represented as inferior. So she's talking about working class people, uh, black and minority ethnic people, LGBTQI plus people, disabled people, and uh, women as well, um, as, as these groups who are either less represented, or when they are represented, they're not represented on the same level as um, middle class white men. So she would also say, and I would agree that it's, it's bad for middle class white men as well, this... It's not the suggestion that there's this evil group of middle-class white men who are trying to suppress minority groups. I mean, maybe some of them are, uh, to speak frankly, but it's more about the power structures and how they're systemic. They're built in. We don't necessarily notice them. She says that hegemony is subtle. It's been going on for years unnoticed. And even those involved in the media might not necessarily realise that they are doing it. And because of that, it often goes unchallenged, although we'll look at some examples later where it's been challenged in recent years. And her point is the reason that it's bad in her mind is that established power hierarchies are constantly reflected back at us by the media and they become the accepted norm. So as a more kind of real life example that I've shared on the call, something that I felt I had to change. Last week I was making a resource for a National 5 English class who were being introduced to some new poetry techniques. And I was lifting some of the poetry definitions from an old textbook. And I noticed that although the, the page that I was lifting the, the definitions from, although they were not speaking about a specific poet, it always referred to the poet using male pronouns. It always said, you know, his simile um, and, and things like that. And I realised that 
it's not that the person writing that book was trying to secretly tell us that they don't like female poets. I mean, maybe they were, but I couldn't possibly say. But it's more just that perhaps when that book was written 15, 20 years ago, it was just what people um, thought to say. Like, it was just kind of their natural thing was to, to use the, the uh, male pronouns. Think about the number of people who say, hey, guys, um, they're not necessarily wanting to um, diminish or, or oppress any... Uh, women in that group it's just become these sort of norms that we have to sometimes question and think about and that's sort of what the the purpose of media is isn't it is to think about how society's been structured and and sort of poke at it a wee bit and try and work out why things happen the way they do so that is her uh, opinion there question 2a which two behaviorist models for analyzing the effect of the media does the article identify? So specifically, she refers to what we call the magic bullet theory and the hypodermic needle theory. And they're both pretty much the same thing. Okay, these are linear communication theories. Okay, so as you can see from this rather crude cartoon, it's the idea that the media is being spoon fed to passive audiences. And we just basically believe exactly what we're told. We take it um, on face value. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich or white or black or um, gay or straight. It doesn't really matter. Like you will, ex you will read the media and accept it in the exact same way. Um, so that is not something that the writer really agrees with. And I would have to say I don't really think that it's useful either in most cases. So part B of the question was why does it find the models inadequate for explaining the effect of the media? The writer of the article says that uh, these are passive audience theories. They assume people are lobotomized zombies who just copy what they see in the media and basically argues that it's not complex enough. So if you've ever seen an argument about violent TV, violent movies, violent video games causing real life violence, that is an example of someone adhering to the magic bullet or hypodermic needle theory because they're assuming that this person has seen something violent and then has gone and done something violent and it's the direct causal link between the media and the action and that there's nothing else that could possibly have influenced that person, which I think we'll all agree is a bit reductionist. It doesn't, doesn't really hold water, I don't think. But that's what she was talking about there. So uh, for 3A, uh, the question was, how is hegemony perpetuated in the media? So how does the media in the UK reflect this idea that there's a systemic power structure in place? She uses a lot of um, data and statistics here. Um, so, for example, she notes that 51% of the UK population is female, but only 13% of working film directors are female. She points out that 14% of the UK population is black and minority ethnic, but only 6% of senior media employees, that's the decision makers at the top, are black and minority ethnic people. She doesn't give any statistics here, but she just says that disabled people are grossly underrepresented. I think if you think of any mainstream, huge, successful um, money-making film or television show from the last five years, how many of them have um, disabled characters represented in them? There might be some, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. And then one that I thought was very interesting, she noted that 54% of journalists in the UK are privately educated, but only 7% of the population attend private schools. So I'm sure the math department will forgive me for doing some basic math. So basically, half of journalists could be said to represent only 7% of the population. Now, there's some issues there. Not every journalist that's privately educated immediately becomes an unempathetic monster who can't um, understand or see the world and the news through the eyes of other people, but it's an interesting statistic nonetheless. Similarly, I don't think people who point out, for example, that first um, observation about 13% um, um, of working film directors are female, I don't think they're necessarily saying that we have to have 51% of all working film directors to be female to, to fix this problem, but I think that they're hinting at that the reason the percentage is so low is that the opportunities at ground level for um, minority groups to get involved in the media is, is quite slim sometimes, and that that's something they'd like to see fixed. So, moving on, uh, for question 3b, what are the consequences of all this for representation? Think back to your National 5 work on representation, how representations are created in the media. So, in the article, the writer thinks that the representations of black and minority ethnic characters, LGBTQI plus characters, disabled characters and female characters are more likely to be created and written by white middle class male creators. Okay. Now, what they're not necessarily saying is that all black and minority ethnic characters need to be written by black and minority ethnic uh, people or that all LGBTQI plus characters must be written by a, a legitimate LGBTQI plus person. I don't think anyone is arguing for that extreme level of representation but they are pointing out that hegemony has resulted in even the most successful famous and, and celebrated 
characters in film and television are not necessarily, you know, the, the, the BAME LGBT disabled and female creators are not getting the same opportunities to present great characters in the way that um, these um, white middle class male creators are. So what I thought to do to illustrate that is I googled and screenshotted famous female TV characters. So you can see them. This is These were the, the first 10 image results on Google. So uh, you might not recognise them all, but th this is what came up. So Buffy from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Olivia Benson from Law & Order SVU, Rachel from Friends, Dana Scully from The X-Files, Annalise Keating from How to Get Away with Murder, Xena from Xena Warrior Princess, Christina Yang from Grey's Anatomy, Monica from Friends, Elaine from Seinfeld, and Phoebe from Friends. So I thought it would be interesting to look at well, who created these? If these are the most famous female TV characters of all time, who created them? So I made this little um, handy guide up here. So Buffy was created by Joss Whedon. Olivia Benson was created by Dick Wolf. Rachel and also Monica and Phoebe from Friends were created by a team, um, David Crane and Marta Kaufman. Dana Scully was created by Chris Carter. Annalise Keating was created by Peter Novak. Xena was created by Robert Trappert. Christina Yang was created by Shonda Rhimes, and Elaine was created by Jerry Seinfeld. So you'll see there that if those truly are the 10 most famous TV characters, um, the majority of them are created uh, by white men. Uh, some of the ones from Friends, obviously Friends are so popular, that's why three characters made it in there, um, created by a team of uh, male and female. And, and one character, Christina from Grey's Anatomy, was created by um, Shonda Rhimes. So... It's interesting. Now, again, it's not trying to suggest that this is necessarily a, a, a terrible thing that these characters have been uh, created by men. Obviously, um, in the 90s, uh, Buffy, for example, Agent Scully from the X-Files, for example, were hugely celebrated in how they presented strong, independent women in television shows, how they really pushed um, representation of females in power. Um, Buffy was the hero of her show, um, Agent Scully was an, a very celebrated um, investigative FBI agent, a kind of um, a progression on from Jodie Foster's character from Silence of the Lambs. So these characters were really celebrated. I don't think it diminishes their success or the progress they made for representation of women in, in TV shows that they were created by men. But it is interesting to think what kind of other great characters would we be exposed to if we had a little bit more pluralism, if there were more opportunities for people to... Um, get involved in write characters that reflect their own experiences. So just as a, somewhat of an example, if you were really taking this argument to uh, to an extreme, you know, you may question that Christina Yang, this very popular Asian-American character from Grey's Anatomy, is written by an African-American character. Um, does Christina Yang represent the experiences of all Asian-Americans? And if she doesn't, is that because she's not written by an Asian-American? I don't have the answer to that, but these are the types of questions that we want to try and tackle when we're discussing media and hegemonic power structures. So, 4A, as I mentioned, what is pluralism? In the article, the writer suggests that pluralism is the opposite of hegemony. So, the idea that the media would be improved if there were wider representations of social, ethnic, gender and sexuality groups. So, it's not just about seeing more characters from those groups, but more characters being created by people from those groups. That's, that's the point. It's about the creator not necessarily just seeing more of the characters that's also what they argue for in pluralism so it's about opportunities as much as it's about representation so uh question b with a personal response question i asked you do you think that pluralism is both desirable and possible and obviously i can't possibly cover all the answers that you gave here and of as much as i could just give you my opinion on pluralism and whether it's desirable and possible I thought instead I'd give voice over to Jamil Smith, who wrote this article in the Times, um, sorry, not in the Times, in Time magazine uh, about Black Panther when it was released. And he specifically writes about some of the things in his opening three paragraphs that we've just been talking about. So um, he says that the first movie I remember seeing in a theatre had a black hero. Lando Calrissian, played by Billy D. Williams, didn't have any superpowers, but he ran his own city. That movie, the 1980 Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, introduced Calrissian as a complicated human being who still did the right thing. That's one reason I grew up knowing I could be the same. 
If you are reading this and you are white, seeing people who look like you in mass media probably isn't something you think about often. Every day, the culture reflects not only you, but nearly infinite versions of you. Executives, poets, garbage collectors, soldiers, nurses, and so on. The world shows you that your possibilities are boundless. Now, after a brief respite, you again have a president. Those of us who are not white have considerably more trouble not only finding representation of ourselves in mass media and other arenas of public life, but also finding representation that indicates that our humanity is multifaceted. Relating to characters on screen is necessary, not merely for us to feel seen and understood, but also for others who need to see and understand us. When it doesn't happen, we are all the poorer for it. And then the rest of his article goes on to review Black Panther in detail. But I think those opening three paragraphs are a really beautiful summation of what I was just talking about there. So he pointed out that when he saw a black hero in Star Wars in 1980, he felt empowered by that. Um, Mentioning that if you're white, you see many different versions of white people in film and TV. But if you're black, you maybe don't see as many, well, not maybe, you definitely don't see as many different types of black characters in mainstream TV and film. And then going on to point out that having pluralism, having more representation, it's not just so that, um, from his point of view, um, black people can be seen. It's also good to educate other people about those communities. So if you only have a very particular narrow type of, of character from a particular group that appears in film and TV all the time, then not only do they not see themselves, but other people from different groups don't get to learn a little bit more about that culture, which I think is a very noble way to put it. I know that some people listening and some people in the class might think the idea of seeing yourself um, on the screen is not really that important, but then perhaps you have to, you know, question yourself and wonder why you don't see it as as important. Is it because you've never not seen yourself, maybe? So, um, moving on. Question five, the article ends by referencing the Legally Black campaign in which activists replaced images of white actors in film posters with black actors. Some examples are displayed alongside the article. What do you think about the posters and in what way might they challenge hegemony? Now, again, this is a personal response and everyone gave me some different answers to this, which is great. Uh, I'm not going to give you my answer. I'm just going to actually illustrate something for you. So you can see there the Legally Black posters, where the uh, big franchises in the UK and around the world, the in-betweeners, Doctor Who and Harry Potter. Um, I listened to an interview with um, one of the people who were involved in, 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 in this campaign, and they said that what they wanted to trigger in the brain of someone walking past was the response, something isn't right. And when they actually started to deconstruct and unpack that idea, something's not right, they would hopefully see that you know they're they're hardwired to assume that the, the faces that we see in these types of franchises are white because there is nothing wrong with the idea of a show like the Inbetweeners with four black characters, a, a black doctor in Doctor Who, or a black Harry Potter. In fact, you may know yourself in the the stage show Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Hermione was played by a black actress. But that's what the the people who made the posters wanted you to think and then to question that because as it says on the tagline each time. If you're surprised, it means you don't see enough black people in major roles. Now, what I thought was interesting here is that one of these three things has actually come true since uh, that campaign was started. And I thought it would be interesting, instead of just giving you my opinion on it, to show you how other people reacted. So earlier this year, January 2020, the BBC flagship science fiction show Doctor Who introduced a black female incarnation of the Doctor. For anyone who's not um, sort of au fait with the show... Um, it's been on TV since the early 1960s. If I remember correctly, the first ever episode aired on the day, or was supposed to air the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So this program has been around for nearly 60 years. And uh, the, 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 the character of the Doctor changes every time an actor leaves the program and they regenerate into a new incarnation. And up until three years ago, they were always um, white men. And Jodie uh, Whittaker there um, became the first female Doctor a few years ago. And in an episode uh, earlier this year that broadcast, they introduced the idea that there was a future incarnation of the Doctor who was a black woman. Now, how do people react to this? Well, let's go to Twitter and find out. So, first of all, interestingly, the actress who appeared in the legally black Doctor Who poster, she uh, mentioned uh, this on Twitter. She said, I was in a legally black UK campaign to open up diversity in the industry. 
Many women's dream came true this week when the talented Joe Martin slayed as the first black female doctor in 57 years. I sat and watched with four generations of women in my family and felt the power of the moment. Another tweet came from Uzumaki J who said, Dear BBC Doctor Who, uh, thank you for finally giving a black nerd and other black nerdy adults and kids a doctor who looks like us. You really don't know how monumental this was and how much it made me cry. Please don't let her be the only one ever. So there was a number of very positive responses like this. Uh, people who would agree with the journalist writing in Time magazine about Black Panther um, who believes in that kind of identity reaffirmation idea that when you see yourself reflected in media, it's empowering. It makes you feel good and uh, you therefore have someone to look up to. Um, however, not everybody um, would necessarily have uh, agreed with this. And I've got some screenshots now, some tweets. Before I move on to them, um, there's not any swearing in them, but I think that some of the stuff that, that the tweets say that I'm going to show you are fairly... Um, um, unpleasant and I think that what we're seeing here is you know if you think that hegemony and power structures are you know just these theoretical concepts it's just something that people make up so they can study media um well I think this is what happens when a hegemonic power structure is shaken and rattled in this case it's the power structure that this character um is traditionally a white male and that by casting a woman or a black female woman in it it is causing um, an issue. So let's have a little look at what some people said. Okay, so here's the first one. A conversation between two people. Um, it says, you, you're you kidding me, right? This is fake, right? This has to be fake. Uh, the next person replies, nope, no mistake, it's true. And then the first person replies again saying, well, damn, I already didn't like this doctor. This just made it worse. So maybe they, maybe they don't just like the doctor because it's a woman um, and maybe this is not making it worse because... It's a black woman, maybe they just don't like the show. But let's have a little further look uh, into the, the cesspit that is Twitter. So, um, a lot of flags here. Um, the first uh, response there says, Pop sci-fi has become and now is crap. No, not because there is a female Doctor Who or black, or even a black female Doctor Who, but because they disregard canon to such an extent that it is no longer recognisable as what it once was and the disenfranchises its base without creating a new stable one. And then a reply here that says, but is that part of the plan? Destroy intellectual properties, largely white and male. Nearly every attempt to force this has ended in failure. A greatly diminished fan base and loss of money. See Marvel Comics after they went woke. Same Star Wars, Star Trek, Terminator, Ghostbusters, etc. Now, as an English teacher by trade, I'm not going to get into the spelling and grammar here because it's obviously a nightmare. But let's talk about what they've said. So I think what's interesting up here is... Um, the use of the word canon, now this person, I am going to talk about the spell, and this person has spelled it as if it's something that you you know shoot off the side of a pirate ship. But when they're referring to the canon, they're talking about the established rules of a world. Um, and, and in this case, the, the canon being disregarded, the, the Doctor can only change so many times and is always a man. So they're really upset by this. Um, and then this the, the second person there seems to think that this casting it's, it's not about celebrating a different group it's about trying to oppress white men and as we all know white men are oh, t terribly oppressed um that was sarcasm in case it's, in case it's not coming across and interesting they give some um sort of incorrect statements here so marvel comics after they went woke i'm not exactly sure at what point they thought that marvel went woke i mean black panther as a character was created in the 1960s but i'm assuming they're talking about um, the more recent Black Panther film, maybe even the Captain Marvel film. Um, last couple of Marvel movies have all made over a billion dollars at the global box office, so I don't think the fan base has diminished that much. Um, they mentioned Star Wars there as well. Um, the Star Wars film that causes the most arguments about representation is The Last Jedi. That was also a billion dollar movie. One of the kind of highest grossing Star Wars movies of all time. So I don't really know. Like It's not that people aren't arguing about it, but it certainly didn't lose many money. So I don't know whether that person is correct. They're obviously just feeling a little bit um, oppressed. Poor, poor, poor oppressed white man. So, uh, some more. Nerdwaffle says, can we start claiming discriminatory or hate writing against nerds? This is just a kick in the teeth. This is stealing our comic books, ripping them up and stuffing us in lockers all over again. So, by casting a black woman, um, oh, that's the, the police arriving to um, deal with uh, discriminatory hate against nerds. Apparently, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, this person is trying to suggest that the casting of a, a black woman as the Doctor is 
metaphorically like being bullied. Um, okay, uh, this person says, so the furs doctor was a black, fat, dreadlocked woman now? I can't even. I bet she's also a lesbian and single mom, so we can tick all those minority boxes, right? So, someone upset at the idea of pluralism, thinking that by representing um, gay women or, or, or single mothers is um, in some way a bad thing. I don't really know. A little bit of body shame in there by saying fat. Not very nice. Um, let's not even get into the use of the word dreadlocked. Finally, um, one more, just to really reflect how, how upset people get. Doctor Who has gone completely hashtag woke. This is nothing more than an attempt to rewrite history and abolish any trace of white men being heroic characters. You can't change canon just to fit your narrative. This is a slap in the face to all the great men who came before. Shame. Um, I don't really know what to say about that one. Um, again, they can't spell canon. I suppose that's a problem. Um, look, I think that without making too much more fun of these people, what you're seeing in action here is, is what happens when a power structure that suits a majority is, is rattled a little bit. You get really upset. So this is the question that I asked on the live call. If this group of men are so upset that for the first time in 57 years, the doctor is a black woman, then how might black women have felt for 57 years when they were never allowed to be seen as the hero in that program? I'll leave that one with you. So, um, the second task, as I said, was a hegemonic analysis of a TV show or film of your choice. I will individually mark those for you on Teams. I'm also going to make a video where I present a hegemonic analysis of Friends, which I'll probably share over the summer because it's taken a little bit of time to put that together. Um, and hopefully that will be something that we can use across the year to remind us of hegemony. Obviously, this is a concept that we're going to use to help us write about our uh, role of media work over the next session. Um, the home learning task for this next week is an introduction to question three, aka the unseen textual analysis question. I have posted that on Teams for you. These are the slides here, which you can read through yourself. I'm not going to do that and bore you to death. It's fairly self-explanatory. And at the end, I've said, if you need any extra help, then please email me at that email address on there. I hope the hegemony answers helped you and helped illuminate the concept that you've been reading about for the last two weeks. And as always, if you want to get in touch, please just fire me an email to that email on the screen and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. And if you complete that work, for the unseen textual analysis, then you can submit that to that email address or you can post it on Teams. Uh, the task uh, assignment, I should say, was posted earlier today. Okay, thank you for watching and I hope you found this helpful.